Good afternoon. I think we'll start. How many of you have seen me before? How many of you have never seen me before? How many of you don't care whether or not you'll see me again? Uh, my name is Bob Etherington. I started in, I'm an engineer by training. I wasn't a very good engineer. Uh, so I went into selling in 1970, which makes me very old. Selling copying machines with Xerox up and down the old Kent Road. That's what I did. Very tough market, very tough employer. You had to succeed, otherwise you got thrown out. Right, it was as bad as that. You were given two months to make the target, otherwise you were out again. It was um, very much uh, in those days, caveat emptor. Anybody know what caveat emptor means? Let the buyer beware. Because the salespeople had all the information, all the power. And you did the demo, it was very much a demo based sale. And uh, the customer asked you a few questions. And if they bought the machine, then decided that it wasn't quite what they wanted, there was no comeback. Now, the only thing that changed then in the last 45 years that I've been selling, 46 now, is everything. Everything has changed. In the olden days, nobody knew who I was and maybe vaguely heard of the company and the product. These days, by the time any one of us gets in front of a customer, they know who you are, they've looked you up on Facebook and LinkedIn, just about all the other sites, just on Google Chip, they know your product and they know your company. It's no longer caveat emptor, it's caveat venditor, let the seller be aware. You've got to be very careful about what you say, because they've checked you out and your product and your company already. Now in that same time when there's been these huge changes in the selling profession, one thing hasn't really changed very much as far as I can see, and that's sales management. Sales management back then was very much taking your best salesman, woman, making them a sales manager. They had a bit of admin work, it was mostly an admin centric job. They still spent a lot of time in the office. They knew they were supposed to be out in the field with people, but they generally weren't. They had to do a bit of hiring and firing, a bit of motivation, a bit of inspiration. And that was sort of the job. And it hasn't changed much. At least not that, that I'm as I run a sales training company now. And basically, most of my customers, until about six years ago, wanted the same sort of thing. Then one of them came to me and he said, do you do anything on sales leadership? And the truthful answer was, no, I don't. But instead of that being a salesman, you don't want to lose some potential business, so I said, what do you want? And what do you mean by sales leadership? And he said, we want to release the human capital in the sales force amongst our sales management team around the world. Now, these very trite HR sort of terms don't mean very much to me. What does that mean to you? Release the human capital. Do you know what it means? I didn't, I don't know. So I said, sort of explain what that would mean to you, that why sales management isn't fixing it and sales leadership is what you need. And he presented me with something I hadn't seen before. A man called Kastenbaum wrote a book about 30 years ago called The Wisdom of Teams. Have you ever seen it? Ever read it? It's basically one of these hockey things. I'm not going to get into a lot of theory about management or anything else. But he said most teams and most companies, whether it's a sales team or a management team or something like that, fit somewhere on that curve. Top performing teams, I mean, a Metcard would be the number 10s, the lowest would be down at nothing. You've got to measure it along an x axis of good times, when you get away with poor performance of the team, interesting times, you can't really, really uncertain times, like the times we're going through now, where you've really got to have a top performing team. And this man, Castamel, discovered a few things. He said that most teams, as I say, most businesses, are somewhere on that curve. One of the most common ones is just here. And it's very common in most businesses. It's called, in his terms, a working group. Any idea what he, why he said that working groups in most companies are very, very common? What do you think is a typical working group? Because it isn't a very effective team, but he thinks it is. What do most companies have a board of? Directors or an executive committee. Executive committees and, 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 and boards tend to be down here. They're a group of sharp elbow people who call themselves a team, but they've got where they are, the finance director, the marketing director, the sales director, by elbowing other people out of the way and being very keen and aggressive. 
So when they get to the top, they're being led by a person called the chairman, who's in it for his own interests for it as well, and the managing director. And they sit there. They're not the w absolute worst form of team, but they're down there. And most companies, or the, take in this country, um, the cabinet office. Do you think David Cameron's cabinet is a team or a working group? Isn't it? Are they really a team? They're all looking after. No, they're all watching out for their own their own backsides. And if there's a chance they could squeeze in, that's what happens. If you get ambitious in a large international company, you better get used to the politics because that's what you're going to be in. But what happens is they decide that running the team, they believe they're a team. In fact, they're a working group. That something needs to be done. New project X needs to be got out into the marketplace. They so, say, so who have we got to lead the team to do that? And they still. This is what generally happens in most businesses. They still say, who is our best salesperson? And they say, Jimmy Bloggs. Yeah, get him in, make him the team leader. As you come in, Bloggs, congratulations. I think you've done a really good job. We're gonna make you the team leader for Project X. You know the team out there? Uh, they're a good bunch of guys, I'm sure you'll agree. We're gonna announce it tomorrow morning, and uh, off you go. Good luck to you. So Bloggs has announced that's the team leader. And everybody gets then pretty pissed off. Because nobody's told them that their colleague Bloggs is now their boss. Nobody's actually instructed Bloggs into the things he's going to have to do as a team leader stroke manager. So everybody feels pretty disgruntled. He probably didn't want to be anything but the job he was doing at the moment, because we know in good commission as a seller. So now to be put in this position as team leader manager, sales manager, is a huge mistake, but most companies still do it. I was talking to my own son-in-law the other week. He owns a mortgage brokerage up in Hitchin. He says we do it all the time because we haven't got time to do anything else. We take our best seller, and he's the sales manager. And what you end up with is what they call down there a pseudo team. It's a team in name only. Everybody feels disgruntled. Nobody really likes where they are. Not the people in the team, and not the people who are leading the team. So very little gets done. Very little changes, except for a lot of hassle in the group. Now just above that, is the potential team, which is about as effective as the working group. It's a team which knows there's a problem and probably knows what's wrong, but doesn't have the courage to take the steps to fix it. And what this man Kastenbaum says is, in most teams, in most organizations, are one of those three. They're a working group, they're a pseudo team or a potential team, not very effective as teams at all. And as we come further up the tail, there are, now that's all right when things are going well, the good times. As soon as things get a bit uncertain, you've got to have a better form of team. This one we call a real team. Now, any idea what makes a real team? What is different from the three down in the corner to halfway up that curve? What is different, do you think? What makes a real team? Authenticity. It's really where everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing and everybody does his job. The manager communicates regularly and when I do sales training around the world, everywhere, it's the biggest problem that comes up is, 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 is downwards uh, communication. I have, don't care where you are, everybody says in every organization, it is poor. And that's one thing they want. In a real team, the manager keeps communicating. I was doing a job in Scandinavia last year and they had a big team problem in the sales force. And I had the sales manager with his team in there. And I said to the sales manager, do all your team understand the objectives for this product? And he said, yes, my team, they all do. And I said to the team, there were six of them in the room, do you all understand? They all said no. It's rather like kids, I think, you know, with your children. If you've got, if you've got children, you say to them, how many times do I have to tell you? Whatever it is. With a sales team, you've got to keep on telling them and reminding them where they're going and what the objectives are. Otherwise, they think they've possibly changed. But in a real team, everybody knows this, and the communication actually happens. And everybody knows what his job is and executes and takes it seriously. But in the military, the army, the navy, the air force, people going out to Afghanistan, people going out to Iraq, they want to be even better than this. They want a high-performing team. Now, what do you think is the difference between a real team, which is perfectly adequate, and a high-performing team? You know, the sort of team, I don't know about you, you often see these young men when we come back from these very dangerous places. All they want to do is get back out there. How do they, how do the army, how do these people get them into that state of mind? 
what it is, is that everybody on a real, in a high performing team regards everybody else's life and project and everybody else as important as his own. They support absolutely each other. And it's very, very rare in outside business, very, very common in the military. And he said, that's what I want my team to do. And the company was giving me the, uh, the, the, the exercise to do. So I went home, went back to the office, and I Googled the word leadership. Now, if you Google the word leadership, how many hits do you think you've gotten? I did this this morning, so my number's very up to date. What do you think it is? How many, if you Google the word leadership, somebody's asked you to train their team in leadership, what do you think is the number of hits you get on Google? Have a guess. As of this morning, it was 756 million. 756 million different ideas of what leadership's all about. But I don't know about you, but I couldn't really pack that into a course, even if there was one in a hundred of these things was right. So I sat down with my business partner and did some analysis. We boiled it down to five key areas. And around that we built the seminar and a course which we offered to our client. And this was 2011. We've since gone on to run that program over and over again around the world. It's been given accreditation by the Chartered Management Institute as well. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about this afternoon, how you can do exactly the same if you want to for your organization. By boiling it down, boiling it down, and boiling it down again, five. So there are five things you've got to do to move from management to leadership. What do you think number one is? What else? Anything? That's, that's part of it as well. Now the word that we managed to identify was you. You the person that somebody has appointed to be a leader, or the person that if you want to be a leader yourself, are you in charge of yourself? This you thing, you've got to be very honest with yourself. No leaders. Let me ask you this, how do we reckon, let me ask all the ladies in the room this question. Ladies, if a strange man enters the room now at the back of the hall and just stands there and looks around, how long in your female psyche does it take you to assess whether he's an alpha male leader type? How quickly do you do it? Now, if you look around the room, you see a guy coming in there, this guy now. How long does it take you to assess whether he's an alpha male leader? How long? Sorry? 30 seconds. Two minutes? Five, it's about five seconds. It's no time at all. It has nothing to do with what you say. It's more to do with what it looks like. I mean, it's, they used to tell us at Xerox, that, uh, and this is back in 1970, the customer actually makes up their mind whether they're going to buy your copying machine, and at 15 seconds it takes you to walk from the door to his desk. And he doesn't realize he's made a decision. Human decision making has very little to do with facts, it's more to do with emotions and how that person makes you feel. We sense, and women do it five times faster than men, in the seconds, whether somebody is, the, is a leader, alpha male type. So how do they do this? How do we know this person's got the right attitude? Because attitude is 75% of good selling. What is it you've got to do? What is it that people with attitude have? What have they done to themselves that's different from what any of you may have done? Well, let me say this. If I was to ask any one of you here, if I was to break into your bedroom at four o'clock in the morning, I'm not going to, no, not really, and shake you out of a deep sleep and say, where are you going to be in three years' time? What is it exactly what you're going to be doing? Tell me. Exactly. I don't know. How many of you know exactly where you want to be in three years? How much money you want to have in the bank? Where you're going to be living? What sort of job you want? How many of you know that? How many of you out of a deep sleep at four o'clock in the morning can tell you? Most of us can't. What about if you were Richard Branson? Do you think he knows? Do you think he'd go, oh, I don't know. You know, I'm sort of going to try and make her do this. Uh, I haven't really thought about it. What do you think about Barack Obama? What are you going to do after your president, after your um, retirement as the president? I don't know. Have a little think, have a little sit down. Do you think, what about Peter Jones or, or, or Alan or Sugar? Do you think any of them go, I don't know? So the thing is that these people know exactly what it is they're going to achieve. And one way or another, they get there. We feel this in other people. Attitude is something you pick up very quickly. So other people pick it up from you. 
There's a lady called Amy Cuddy on um, TED Talks. Have you seen her? A professor of psychology at, uh, at uh, Harvard. And she said there's something you can very rapidly do to give you this feeling of power and strength which other people pick up from you if you want to be a leader. Go look at the TED Talk tonight. Put in the words Amy Cuddy. She's a very pretty lady, but she's also very clever. She says there are things that physically you can do. She says she calls these two-minute power poses. Before you've got anything difficult to do, or you're going to stand in front of your team, she said, go, well, nobody's looking at you, go into a power pose like this. As human beings, when you've done anything well, good, and you feel good, you tend to do one of these. Even blind people have been at the Olympics. They've never seen anybody who tend to make our body larger. And they said it works in the other direction as well. If you want to be see somebody who's in charge of a leader, try that yourself. For two minutes before you look at me in front of your group, somebody want to be in front of them. Go into a power pose for two minutes, oh, make your body bigger and larger. And strange enough, you're going to feel a lot better than going to the meeting. People don't pick up that vibe from you. It's very strange. Very confident. Very confident. Because confident is bullshit, after all. Nobody knows what's going to happen next. I did an interview for the Financial Times uh, three years ago. So what is confidence? I think it is bullshit. You've got to pretend if you're a camera or a president of the United States, you know what's going to happen next. No one knows. You've got to act out the parts you can do, because that's what people want. Nobody's going to be led by you in a, in a, in a, in a Wild West movie. The cavalry charge is always... Isn't it? And we jump up. What's the cavalry charge? Who's going to follow that? Nobody. So the first thing you're going to throw out is you. The second thing we identified is that good leaders are strategists. How many of you can tell me what is the difference between a strategy and a plan? Very important.
to say what we're planning to do isn't working. A lot of bosses of, of, of sales groups say, well, next year we're going to have a 10% increase in sales. Strategy demands that you ask what makes you think we can do that. Because we did it last year, not a good enough answer. The markets are changing, everything's changing all the time. The next thing, if you've got a strategy, you have to be executed. You have to be able to put in plan some actions. Team and you say, 